The Scream from 1800 to the Present by Thomas Ligotti. Near the close of the 18th century, William B. is approaching his destination of a saloon on Boston's waterfront. As he passes through a narrow alleyway, someone jumps him from behind and wraps a length of thin but strong rope around his neck. While he is being choked to death, he looks up and can see the moon over the tall shops and houses lining the alley. He knows he is going to die and cannot believe the injustice of it on almost every level. That he should die before he'd had a drink that night. That he should die without realizing a single one of the marvelous dreams which had sustained his life in the first place. In his final moments, he would have settled for the small satisfaction of releasing a scream to relieve somewhat the purely physical anguish of being strangled to death. But his murderer, an expert waylayer, is pulling the rope too tight, and not a sound is able to escape from William B.'s throat. Later that night, a pack of huge wharf rats nibbles the body before it is discovered by some local prostitutes. The spirits of murder victims are notorious avengers. They are well known for lingering in the human world and walking the earth in search of their slayers. Suppose, however, the spirit has no idea of what its murderer looks like. The spirit could haunt the scene of violence and perhaps nearby areas, hoping to pick up some gossip, a chance lead. But beyond this, there isn't much that can be done. The spirit has such a marvelous revenge planned to let loose its terrible scream, now an instrument of supernatural ferocity and horror, into the face of its murderer, killing him in one of the worst ways imaginable. But the strangler is never found. Eventually, the passing years exceed the longest possible human lifespan. The murderer has undoubtedly been dead for some time. And how many years remain to the spirit, haunted by its unfulfilled quest for vengeance? The spirit happens to settle in a secluded but very pleasant looking home where undisturbed and undisturbing it watches the generations come and go. Always, though, the spirit feels the suppressed scream it carries inside and the hopelessness of finding someone for whom this scream of his would mean something. The spirit has a lot of time to think and wonder why he has never met others in a state similar to his. This would be some compensation, but the idea, like the passing generations, comes and goes and is never pursued very diligently. His mind hasn't really been clear at all since those last lucid moments of dying. Toward the end of the 20th century, the spirit begins paying midnight visits to a beautiful and apparently lonely girl who lives in the house of well-preserved seclusion. It seems she has fallen in love with the apparition that keeps her company in the dark hours of her solitude. The spirit is now thankful for its fate, realizing that it is his anguished and imprisoned scream sustaining his presence. While he has the scream within him, he can stay on earth and be seen. He now holds it inside like something extremely precious. 
One night the spirit is keeping his appointment by the girl's bedside. When he sees, it's all been a mistake. The girl is neither lonely nor in love with him, though she is more beautiful than ever. And someone else is lying next to her in bed. This is both a torment and a relief for the spirit. Finally, he has a reason to let go of his terrible scream. Finally, it will mean something. It would annihilate the both of them while they slept. Did you hear something? The man sleepily asks the girl. Just barely, she replies, with her eyes still closed. Go back to sleep, whispers the man. It was probably nothing. And it was nothing. For the spirit now suffers the horrific revelation that after so many years, the scream itself has died its own death and has left him not only utterly alone, but also completely imperceptible behind his private wall of eternity.